Hi, this is Jeff Starr. Thank you for joining us. I'm joined with Nate Doves and Kirsty Omoda. Today, we are Yield. We're a ministry that serves the College of the Area Youth. We are a multi-church youth discipleship program, and we're glad you're here with us today. We're going to be doing a deep dive today into the first three or, or four chapters of Genesis, talking about the first family. And before we get started, I want to have prayer with you. So let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for your blessings to us. Thank you for working with our families and our, when we mess up, you're giving us grace. We thank you for your guidance today. Please be with us and be with this discussion. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, let's dive right into it. Hey guys, thanks for joining us. This is Yield and our deep dive into our lesson that we're going to be talking about. Uh, thanks for joining us. And we're looking at uh, how God can use families, basically, is what we're talking about. And, and we're going to look at the first family. The first family in Genesis has some big turns. Like they come from a perfect family. And so I want to kind of unpack that. What do you guys think it was like to not know sin, not have any idea? Like right now we can talk about, well, what's it like to be perfect? We don't have any idea, but they didn't have any idea about sin. So what do you think that was like? Yeah. So scripture, you know, we, we go to the very first story um, of the very first family and it's Adam and Eve. They're living in the garden. And, um, you know, when you read that story, I encourage you guys to go back and read it. It's so encouraging to read that to realize like that God created this world to be perfect I mean you, you work mm -hmm. through those days of creation and God is always saying yeah it's good it's good it's good and then you, you, you make it to the sixth day of creation where God creates um, humanity and he says it's very good and I, and I just think that's really cool to realize like God created families what wasn't good is for people to be isolated by themselves take that COVID-19 um, but, um, so that's not a good thing, but what is good is to have, um, family. God said, once he had a family created, he said, this is very good. Well, I love how much the, the scriptures take time. Like he speaks and the trees were there. He speaks and the fish were there. He speaks and, and animals were there. And then he takes time to make man and woman and make the first family. And it was something, yes, he's proud of the other work that he's spoken to exist, but he's like, this is really good when he makes man. It's, it's really cool to see in scripture. Yeah, and you know, I I think it it kind of resembles some of these TV families, right? That seem to be perfect when you're watching. Uh, I don't know, Full House. I think I grew up watching that, you know. And it seems like <laughs> oh, they have a show. little spat, you know. <laughs> oh, the Cosby Show, right? That's beforehand. That's true. And and then it's like, oh, I wish my family was like that. But the reality is, those families maybe resemble what the perfect family was like before, you know, <laughs> sin, but not necessarily what our families look like today. Right. Mm -hmm. I, the, I wonder yeah, if, I mean, the if sad, Adam and Eve, the, if I, go ahead. Oh, you're, you're good. I was just going to say the, the sad thing is, is that that perfection didn't last. They were created perfect. God gave them a perfect place to live. And, and most of us are familiar with this story. He just said, Hey, there's one tree in an entire garden. Don't eat from that one tree. <laughs> and like that was it. Like they just couldn't handle it. And so they, they ate from this tree um, and things started changing pretty quickly. I wonder if it's like when you, when somebody tells, don't tells a young kid, like don't press the button, <laughs> like they, they got to press the button. No, it was a little more serious than that. Uh, but imagine like we get discouraged when we make wrong choices. We get uh, upset at ourselves or our family when, when we make wrong choices. Imagine the, the disappointment from God and the disappointment from Adam and Eve, like they knew what it was like to be perfect. Like we said earlier, we have no clue what it's like. Uh, they knew, and then they experienced the fall. And it wasn't just like some arguments. There's some serious stuff that happened we're going to get into. But the, the feeling of frustration, the feeling of disappointment and disappointing God, when you disappoint someone you love, that's so hard to sometimes to get over. And they had to deal with that as they started to, as they left the garden and, and went through all the trials that are now going to come because of their choices. You know, I think that it's a testament that even though the Adam and Eve's family were perfect right before they had their kids, right? And the concept is we really don't have an example of what a perfect family looks like. Like everyone's influenced based on who they get along with and what they see uh, on what a normal family would look like, right? So the truth is nobody 
has a normal family because a normal family is extremely subjective. So because of that, um, I would say turning to, to, to the word and getting, learning from other families and saying, okay, this is what not to do <laughs> would help us have a healthy normal uh, for what our families can look like, right? So I think we're turning to Genesis now uh, where we can go ahead and take a look at the first family. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so this, this family, they, they experience these, um, these heartaches. We, we find this story. They're sent. Uh, they sin. They're sent out of the garden. God, God approaches them. And we know the story. They hide. And so you can just see the effects of the fall. Um, they hide. And then it's, it's really fascinating. As you read through in Genesis um, chapter 3, um, God had told them that if they ate from this tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, uh, we find that in Genesis 2, 15 and 17, that they would, that they would die. And so there's all of these moments. They've eaten the fruit. They're hiding from God. They feel naked. So they're cu- trying to cover themselves up with um, leaves. And um, the this, this story, you know, it progresses on and it has, has God coming through. And Genesis 3, 8, it says, um, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from God among the trees. And again, you just see like this concept of like... Um, this family that definitely included God as an important part of their family, like it's fracturing. Uh, they come and you expect God to like kill them, like right there kind of, like for them to die because he said that's what's going to happen. Or if he wasn't going to kill them, that something would happen. And yet, you know, the story keeps going, which I, which I think is like re- really indicative of God's grace. I also think as we read the entire story in its entirety, we know where it's going to end up. I think this is the first time we see shame in the Bible and shame is such a powerful tool that the devil uses. Once we've messed up, then the shame comes like they've already messed up and then they're going to hide from the one person that can help them. Right? Like they've, they've messed up. They don't go running to him. They go running away from him. And so many times I do that when I mess up, I don't go running to God and we should. And, and I think shame does that shame drives us away. And I think we, as we get into this story a little deeper, that's what happened with, with Cain and Abel, their kids. I mean, you come from parents who were perfect and then the, the shame grows and resentment starts from there. And, and we'll get into that story, what happens in a moment. Um, so in Genesis chapter four, what happens, what happens to their kids? Well, you know the story, how this goes. <laughs> uh, Cain, uh, being a laborer of the field, uh, decided one day when God asked them to give a sacrifice, he was like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and use, uh, not going to follow what God said. I'm going to go ahead and bring these fruits from my labor, right? And sacrifice that to the Lord. Now, Abel, um, some would say had the advantage because he worked with the sheep in the house, right? And in that kind of situation. And he decided to follow the instructions that God gave. And he brought the the lamb, like God had said and sacrifice that and God accepted Abel's sacrifice and he didn't accept Cain's and then you know what ensues jealousy shame anger guilt all of the above and eventually uh, Cain invites Abel out to the field and Abel is no more after that right so uh, Cain goes ahead and he kills his brother and uh, that's kind of how that story went uh, until God confronts Cable. Uh, Cable. <laughs> that's a, uh, I'm joining both of them together. <laughs> uh, God confronts Cain and asks him, hey, where's your brother? And he's like, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. Um, but he knew uh, very well what was happening. And then he received uh, uh, punishment, basically, well, for and, that. And how, that's the question I wanted to get to right now was how was God's grace where was God's grace in his response in that punishment? Like he received punishment. Where was God's grace in that? Well, it's kind of fascinating as you go through that story of, of Cain and Abel, God, God doesn't come like with guns blazing. Like he doesn't come like on a horse and like not asking any questions just to like destroy Cain for killing his brother. Like, this is a big deal. Like you just see humanity spiraling out of control. This, this whole family is just spiraling out of control. And yet God doesn't come like, uh, you know, throwing lightning bolts at the guy. He comes and he talks with him. And he asks, I, I appreciate Pastor Curcio. He, he asks a question like, um, you know, where's your brother? <laughs> he, starts, he starts talking to him. And, um, and so God's, the punishment specifically that God gives to him that we find in Genesis 4 is he says, uh, you're cursed. And because you're cursed, it's going to be basically hard for you to get food and earn it from the, um, 
you know, to grow stuff from the ground. And he says, you're also going to have to basically be banished. And so, I mean, even that sounds like a light punishment, I guess, in some ways. And then, but then Cain starts complaining and God actually listens to him. Cain starts complaining, says, whoa, 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 my, my punishment is too great. People are going to find me and they're going to kill me. And God says, no, he said, no, he says, I'm going to put a special mark on you. Like if anyone, if anyone tries to, to harm you, I'm going to avenge, avenge you sevenfold. Like, and so he just talks about and says, he essentially actually protects this guy, not because he's pleased with what he's done, but because he's a God of grace. And, um, well, and he's a God willing to forgive. I think like, I, it doesn't ever show Cain like saying, I'm sorry. It kind of, I'm sorry, because I have the punishment, but God is willing to forgive. He's willing to work with you. And I think that's the attitude, like when a family member does something wrong to us, I think it's easy to be mad because we kind of take them for granted sometimes. Like I, I remember arguing with my brother growing up, we could have, I mean, almost, and sometimes fist fights. And, but we knew they're still gonna be there. Like they're, they're still gonna, so I could be mad at him, but I wasn't always quick to forgive. And I think God being able to be quick to forgive gives us that blueprint like of how we need to treat our family, how we need to be willing to forgive and show grace. And I love what he does there um, and still willing to work through them. Yeah, and I, I wanna add to that in the sense that God, could have done like he did in other times in the old testament where it's like you didn't follow the rules boom drop dead and this is what we're what we're talking about here where god is extending this grace but i really think he was trying to give the family now adam eve cain and abel uh an example of how to handle their differences um because if you think about it adam and eve to that point uh were the only ones who had lived in perfection cain and abel came later so then the idea is they are seeing this. They were probably thinking when they finally found out that their son had, in essence, killed their other son. I mean, they didn't know how to handle I'd assume that they didn't know how to handle that, right? And God was basically letting Cain know, look, you could have handled it this way with Abel, where you could have had a conversation with him and be like, hey, why did this happen? And they could have figured it out. I mean, there, there could have been a scrum between the two, like if I use Jeff's example and I have a brother as well, and we went to uh, fisticuffs, like we call them <laughs> as well, and we survived it. But the idea is he was trying to let them know, look, you could show grace, you could show mercy and solve your issues by having a conversation. Because again, your family was not perfect. They obviously and evidently sin had already coerced them to the point where Cain would go to this extreme to solve the difference uh, with the sibling. So, so, I kind of feel a little encouraged in the sense that, that God isn't looking for families to be destroyed the way Satan is. And he still wants to use, even when we make mistakes, to, to, he wants to use those for us to have growth and then be able to be an example, potentially, to other families that are trying to find a healthy norm. Exactly. And I think that's so clear of how we can find hope in this story. But I think that we can go a little bit farther. I want to jump to Romans 5. And Nate, if you have that, um, why, how can we learn even more from this? I mean, we can learn about grace from God in almost every story of the Bible. We can, and I think every story he's in, we can learn about grace from, from him. Uh, we can learn about what maybe we shouldn't do. But how, what else can we gain from this? Ro Romans chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. If you're listening, you can turn there with us. Romans 5, 18. So go ahead, Nate. Yeah, this is, it's really fascinating because it kind of, yeah, it kind of goes along with what uh, Pastor Kirstie was just saying. Um, we we find find out what's going on that that God had a plan to continue to use this kind of dysfunctional family. So, Romans five um, eighteen says, therefore, as through one man's offense, that would be talking about Adam, their decision. Therefore, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteousness, that'd be talking about Jesus, who was a offspring of this family. So through one man's righteousness, righteous acts, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. In the final verse, verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I love this verse because it kind of, um, it, it allows us to see what the rest of the story can be for a family. We don't really have a lot of the details on what 
what happened with Cain's heart. We know that he ended up fathering um, that different people and it created different civilizations. They built cities and stuff like that, but we don't really know what was going on in his heart necessarily. Um, we know that Adam and Eve obviously had more children and continued to do things like that. But I love this because this text in Romans not only tells us that God redeemed their particular story to bring Jesus Christ into the world generations later, I think it's just a really cool example of how it talks about how through one person's offense, there was sin that entered the world. And you can see that within families. You know, families, uh, if they're dysfunctional, if there's hatreds or bitterness or, or backbiting, I mean, if there's all this different kind of stuff happening, it can pass from generation to generation to generation. Uh, alcoholism, abuse, these things can continue to pass on. And yet it's amazing. As soon as Jesus enters the story, um, you know, it says through one person's decision, there's like generational dysfunction. But when Jesus enters through his entering into our stories, all of a sudden there can be grace and there can be growth. And um, a, a lot of a lot of health can come into families when when we allow Christ to reign in in our hearts. Yeah, I mean, and and the neat thing that stands out to me too is Cain was cursed. Like like most people don't don't stop to to think about this. Right after he he kills him, right, and the Lord asks him, uh, "Where's your brother?" And he's like, "I don't know. Where, I don't know where my brother is. Am I his keeper?" The Lord is like, "What have you done? Like, dude, really?" And then. He tells him, you know, you're cursed and, and the ground isn't going to work for you the way that it has. Obviously, he was probably a really good gardener, right? He had a green thumb, though I have a black one. Don't count on me for gardening. But anyhow, so the idea is um, he, he's, he curses him, but at the same time, he's merciful to him. And he doesn't let what should be the outcome of what he's done be done to him. Which to me is, is so interesting, again, pointing out what we just read in Romans, how he says, all right, this is what you did, but this is what I'm going to do. His plan is still to redeem. His plan is still to, to embrace, to walk alongside, to protect, even though sin has cursed us. You know, you got to think about this. We are born into sin and shaping in iniquity now. And God isn't saying, you know what, because you're cursed, I'm done with you and, you know, off with you. No, no, no. He's like, yeah, okay, this is the result, but I want to offer you something better. And he created this plan through Jesus to redeem us from what Adam did. And then obviously we're seeing the repercussions from that decision acted out within their own family. And I just love how God is like, hey, I'm here for you. I'm walking with you. I am going to extend grace, even though sin abounds. There's going to be even more grace than the sin that exists, because ultimately what I want is, is your salvation. And I think that's just an awesome picture to frame this, that even the families that are broken, all right, even the families that are not perfect, which some of us are in, okay, God still wants to find a way to redeem those families. He's trying to find a way to, to, to help us grow and ultimately save us in the family that we didn't choose to be a part of. Because let's face it, guys, you didn't choose what family you were born into. I didn't. And sometimes we just have to roll with the punches, right? Like they say. But in the end, if we allow God to, to, to draw close to us and we walk with him, he can still accomplish his goal, even though it may be tough because we live in a sinful world. So it's so good. Thank you, Tercio, for sharing. That's awesome. And I was thinking that the word in their lifetime, Adam and Eve, their family, they went through some hard times. And like I said, we said earlier, they knew what it was to be perfect and they knew what it was to sin and fall. And they already had those hardships. And then they had murder. Now they had what Cain did. <clears throat> and so, so some of the worst things happened to them, but then yet the gospel comes through this family. Like the greatest thing, the greatest news you can ever share is Jesus coming to die for you and, and change and be willing to change you, give you a choice. And so God was able to accomplish that with this family. And so our brokenness, what is God able to accomplish through our brokenness? That we, we can't understand. Right? The, the Bible says we don't understand the plans he has for us. We can't, we can't get it. So allow him to be a part of those and, and change us. I want to turn to Galatians 5.22, Galatians 5.22 and 23, and just kind of and give us some encouragement, maybe give us some things we can focus on with our families. When we, we're like, yeah, that's nice for Adam and Eve. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I agree. Jesus saved us, but my family is awful. <laughs> Whatever we're saying this morning, uh, what's some encouragement? And, and I know there's, there's families that are all over the, the, the map on this, and some are living in this, this type of environment that is uh, unsafe, maybe. And I challenge and encourage you to reach out 
for help. Uh, too many times, I, I, I think we say, we speak up when we shouldn't and we don't speak when we should. And so I think speak up if, if you're in one of these environments that, uh, that's unsafe. Uh, but what, what, what's some encouragement in Galatians 5, 22 and 23? It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance in the New International Version, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. And, you know, I, I find that to be uh, an encouraging text because it's basically encouraging us on how we ought to behave. Right. It's telling us, hey, what we want to see, the fruits of these of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, is that we have love for one another, that we experience joy, that we experience peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And against these things, there's no law. So so I repeated that so we can we can really cement this in our minds. Now, here's the truth. I don't know about you. But. My family, where I grew up in, was broken. It was broken due to the fact that my dad came from a broken family. You know, my mom came from uh, a very interesting dynamic inside of her household with 10 siblings, right? And, and the idea is all of our families have different parts of it that is broken. And because of that, that gets passed on to us, like Nate said earlier, generation to generation to generation, right? So, so the idea is we are influenced by our history. But what I'm hearing here is as we draw closer to God and we allow his Holy Spirit to dwell within us, maybe we can be the ones to let the, sh the light shine through that brokenness, through those cracks that are present within our family, where we can be the ones showing the, the fruits of the Spirit, where we can show the love and show the joy and have uh, uh, peace and, and show patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and even self-control when we want to strangle our family, right? <laughs> or, when, or when we look at other families and we say, man, if my family looked like that, then maybe we would have a normal family. But, but guys, look, and you've heard this cliche before, the grass always looks greener on the other side. However, it's also greener where you water it, right? And, and I have one that, that I, I've adopted and adapted which is, you know, the grass is all, looks greener on the other side until you realize it's artificial tur turf. Because there are some families that may give you that idea that they have it all together. But they, that's probably just a facade. And the kids inside aren't going to talk about what's really happening. So instead of trying to, 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 to have this approach of woe is me, I think this text in Galatians chapter 5 is encouraging because when we draw closer to God, we can be that instrument used to demonstrate him to my family and God can still redeem someone from my family, even though it's broken. And that's the whole point we want to draw, bring out this, this morning is that God can use the, your family in and you in the mess that we find ourselves in like he has the ability to to use i've, I've used this phrase often uh, he, god can use the devil's tools better than the devil does so what, what the devil tries to cause for evil like god can use for good that doesn't mean that god causes everything doesn't mean that god's up there like pulling all the strings and every sin in this world is from satan and we need to remember that when we go through our trials but god can use the trial that you're in I think we talked about last week, are we going to allow this trial to, to let us be closer to God or farther away? So the challenge is your family can bring you closer with God when we allow it to. I appreciate that reminder. And I, and I also love how, how the story um, is also that reminder that we're not having to do it by ourselves. You know, that, that concept that these fruits of the spirit, um, I, I love how that's encouraging us to create the world we want, you know, but life doesn't always um, work perfectly like that, but we can choose the type of people that we want to be, and we can choose what type of uh, family member we want to be, and that's where I think the fruits of the Spirit come in. And then it's so encouraging to realize that, um, you know, that that realization that Jesus eventually came from this family line of, of Adam and Eve, and, and I think that that brings a lot of hope as you go through the rest of the Old Testament and see the family lineage of Jesus. Um, there, it's difficult families. It's not like Brady Bunch happy families. It, it's hard families. And I think it's so encouraging to realize that um, Jesus isn't afraid to join in with us. He's not, he's, you know, that's the, one of the most beautiful things about Emmanuel, God with us, is that Jesus isn't afraid to, to be part 
of the dysfunction, maybe that exists. Um, he just he wants to come in and give hope for the for the future. And so, if you find yourself in um, a family that's annoying, Jesus wants to be there with you. If you find yourself with a family that's awesome, great, Jesus wants to celebrate with you. If you find yourself in a in a family where there's lots of pain or disagreement, dysfunction, Jesus is not afraid to be there with you. Um, we, we can fully trust that he's the type of savior and God that wants to be with us, whatever we're going through. And so, uh, whatever family you find yourself in, know that there's another member in that family, and that's Jesus. Amen. And, and I want to also encourage our listeners, um, instead of finding opportunities to uh, talk about shame or put down other families because they're not as normal as yours, uh, I want to encourage you to, to potentially be a blessing to those other families, right? Like we have friends and some of our friends, maybe the dynamic in their home isn't exactly like ours. And we may feel like ours is, is, is pretty normal. And, and we just want I want to encourage you guys to to understand that maybe God is 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 allowing that to play out for them in a way that it's going to help them reach people that you may not be able to reach. Mm-hmm. And what I'm saying is, for instance, one of the friends that I have growing up, uh, his family was broken. the The idea early on in in our culture was you separated from families that were broken because you didn't want your family to end up like theirs. But the truth is he and I pulled closer and he felt like my family then embraced him and gave him that sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is encourage you to say, hey, if you see another family that's hurting, um, instead of drawing away from them and thinking that, that their situation may influence your situation, I would say, how about the opposite? conquer evil with good. And if you see somebody hurting, you see a family that is broken, that needs to have some kind of uh, normalcy or semblance of such, go ahead and embrace them. Like, like, like lean forward, lean into that and, and, and give them that sense that they, uh, that they're losing at this time. And I think it would be awesome where God can, can use you to be a blessing because you're blessed with the nice situation. I hope that so, no, that makes sense. sense. That's that's so good. I wanted to share something if it comes up here. Um, but we, we're going to close here today. But thank you guys so much for joining us. And if you want some more information about our ministry, go to yield.live. Uh, you'll be able to find our inf- some information there. We do a weekly podcast and video with a deep dive. If you want to join our Sabbath school, Yield is a multi-church youth ministry discipleship. Uh, and I want to just read this real quick. It kind of sums this up what you were just talking about, Chris. Leo. A man saw a snake being burned to death and decided to take action to bring it out of the fire. When he did, the snake bit him, causing excruciating pain. The man dropped the snake and it fell back into the fire. So the man looked around and found a metal pole and used it to try to get the snake out of the fire. And he was able to. Someone was watching this and approached the man and said, the snake bit you and you are still trying to save it. The man replied, the nature of the snake is to bite, but that's not going to change my nature, which is to help. Do not change your nature simply because someone harms you. Do not lose your good heart, but learn to take precautions. So this breaks down. It's not true for everybody. There's situations that you do actually have to get out of, right? But when someone causes pain, use precautions, but don't let that change your nature, which is where God is leading you. And God has big plans for you, you and your family. We pray for you. And thank you for joining us. Again, go to yield.live for more information. Have a good day, guys. Take care. See you guys. Thanks for joining.